Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This event will be part of our continuing participation at this year Venice Architecture Biennale, and particularly in the Italian Pavilion and the virtual Italian Pavilion curated by Alessandro Melis and Tom Kovac. I am Maria Perbellini, Dean of the School of Architecture and Design, and it is my absolute pleasure on behalf of New York Tech and our school to introduce our moderators, Trudy Brands, visiting professor and interim director of our interior design department and associate professor Farzana Gandhi. I am delighted to welcome the panelists, uh, Suchi Reddy, uh, founder of Ready Made in New York City, and Mariana Ibanez, Associate Professor and Chair, uh, UCLA Architecture and Urban Design and Founder and Principal of Ibanez Kim. Thank you so much, Suchi and Mariana, for accepting our invitation. We are excited to have you here with us tonight. We will also have our endowed chair and curator of the Italian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, Alessandro Melis, who will talk a bit about uh, the experience and the exhibition at the Venice Biennale and will introduce our guests as well and our moderators. Female representation in architecture practice and in academia uh, in a male dominated profession is still low. In ACSA 2019 data, 31% of 110 deans at US and Canadian ACSA architecture schools were female, only 31%. This number has increased though uh, by at least 12% uh, compared to the same number in the previous five years. So there is some uh, good trend uh, already happening. As one of these female deans rising the charge, reflecting every day on the purpose of education and because I have engaged with the issues of gender equity and diversity during my entire career, I am convinced that education is a crucial platform to overcome systemic barriers where the next generation of talent reflects the diversity of our collective communities and where we can catalyze accountable change. Expanding a bit on a broader picture, architecture schools today have the mandate to push the identification of urgent questions like diverse representation, social justice, social inclusion, affordable housing and services for vulnerable populations, taking the helm in reshaping the design profession. At the School of Architecture and Design, we are seriously invested in the creation of a diverse talent pipeline as a catalyst for growth. We have focused on young professional programs to encourage women to take STEAM not only STEM, but STEAM related studies and careers. Many initiatives promote diverse student leadership opportunities in academic and professional organizations, as well as in intercultural and identity based initiatives. Our internal dialogue is enriched by lectures, symposia, exhibitions, events. And I would stress the importance of public recognition of faculty and student research and accomplishments. We also support first generation college students, students from low income family, students with a multicultural background through programs, events and initiatives that form our school's culture, bringing people together from different perspectives and have, we have advanced a more human, in this way, we have advanced a more human and caring community. Unity, solidarity, 
and connection are driving change in students' mindsets. And they become responsible citizens of our world because of the education and the responsibilities that we have with them and for them. I am optimistic about the role in providing unique educational experiences engaged with a range of design trajectories, some not yet foreseen, as well as emerging technologies through expanded and shared investigations of the impact on globally significant issues. While our students in this moment learn digitally, the inequities of education are still here. Access to technology, internet connection, spaces to study and facilities reveal the complexities of some of those uncomfortable conversations around privilege and access to affordable education, access to healthcare and housing. And in conclusion, what I can tell you is that I wanna welcome you tonight here. Uh, we are a inclusive community where voices are heard and differences are celebrated. It's a cultural approach that should not be taken for granted. We aim to offer the tools to question, and this lecture, I hope, will question something, to question what it takes to intentionally build and foster inclusion and diversity in all its forms. Alessandro, please. Uh, I don't know if you are already here with us. Alessandro Melis will introduce now Farzana and Trudy. And later, Farzana and Trudy will introduce Mariana and Suchi. Thank you all. Thank you, Maria. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank our Dean. Maria Perbellini for the great opportunity here that I have today to represent our school in this, uh, in its effort to uh, foster uh, diversity and inclusivity, which is, as you probably know, if you visit the Italian Pavilion, is a crucial aspect of the design of the Italian Pavilion. It's, uh, uh, it's within the roots of the idea of the Italian Pavilion. Um, at the center of the Italian Pavilion, you will find a section which is, uh, coordinated by rebel architects uh, led by Francesca Perani, which is uh, uh, titled Decolonizing the Built Environment. And there is a subsection which is about the talks in the city. Uh, this, is, this has to do with the idea that we need to change, to extend the taxonomy of architecture and to uh, be aware that uh, the needs of change today are not only because uh, in terms of diversity and inclusivity, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a need of justice, but also it, it's because it's something that is called by the emergencies of the climate, uh, climate crisis and the environmental global crisis. Um, at, the, at the entrance of the Italian pavilion, in fact, you will find a section which is called, about, it's, it's called architectural acceptation. It refers to one of the major revolution in science and uh, uh, probably one of the most important recent uh, extension of uh, our scientific taxonomy in the biology of evolution. This is a taxonomy led by uh, Stephen Jay Gould and Elizabeth Vruba with the ex extension to uh, biologic taxonomy to acceptation in deterministic processing design. The reason why this is important for us today, in, in my opinion, uh, in the link, in the way that we wish to, uh, you, to, to consider, to connect the Italian Pavilion to this series of events is because uh, what we learn from nature is that the only way to overcome crisis lays in the uh, creativity of the structure. And creativity of the structure in uh, biological terms uh, is, uh, uh, it is represented by diversity, redundancy, and variability of this structure, of its components. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, the science, biology is telling us that uh, diversity, redundancy, and variability 
and in social terms, inclusivity and everything that we do to foster equity in our society is not only an ideological uh, need or aim, it's not only about justice, it's about finding a way to uh, in increase our uh, opportunities of survival in this planet. Uh, to do so, I want to use a, a phrase, a statement that has been uh, a very bold statement uh, by Yuan Birney, the uh, director of ENCODE, the first uh, uh, group of scientists who were able to, to sequence the human genome. They said to represent how diversity is important, uh, the uh, they represent, they describe the, the genome of uh, humans in this way. It is a jungle full of strange creatures. So the aim of the Italian pavilion is that we become confident enough with the diversity to be able to build a cit cities which are like jungle full of strange creatures, because this is the only way to overcome crisis. Uh, beyond the Italian pavilion, as you know, this is, uh, th th this year there was uh, a huge effort by the Fondazione to express this direction with the award to Lina Bobardi. And in our, from our perspective, I take the chance to uh, remind that uh, the, the uh, closing event of the Italian Pavilion is a celebration of the work of Diane Lewis, important representative in, uh, of uh, New York architecture and the female perspective in New York. So, uh, I want to take, so this is, these are the reasons why I'm particularly grateful for you all to having given me the opportunity to introduce uh, uh, our important guests uh, through the uh, path that we have tried to build during this year. I would like to take the chance also to thank the organizer of this event, uh, Trudy Brands and Farzana Gandhi, represents the interim director interior design program and visiting professor at New York Institute of Technology, the School of Architecture, and Farzana Gandhi, associate professor at the New York, New York Institute of Technology, School of Architecture. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, to uh, listen to the lectures by Sushi Reddy and Mariana Ibanez. I'm, uh, but I would like to leave the stage to Trudy and uh, then to uh, Farzana to introduce our uh, impressive uh, and exceptional partner. Thank you so much, Alessandro. Thank you to our uh, Dean Terbellini for making this possible. And thank you to our uh, coordinators uh, with the um, uh, lectures and event committee for the, giving us the opportunity to organize this very important event. More importantly, we express immense gratitude for our panelists, faculty, students, and audience joining us today. Inclusive Design Trajectories is the title of our, our lecture, The Female Voice in Architecture and Design. The fall lecture series at NYIT School of Architecture and Design aims to facilitate discussions in the field of architecture, design, and urbanism, and its contributions in ecological, social, and built environment. Women in the field of architecture, interior design, urban design, and urban design bring a unique perspective necessary for the way we design inclusive environments today. The lecture topic is framed around the specific challenges confronting female practicing architects around the world. The panelists will discuss their personal experiences as they navigate the profession. They will bring unique perspectives giving their non-Western cultural and ethnic background and offer insight to finding opportunities within limitations they might have, they might have faced in uh, as immigrant uh, practitioners working both in the United States and abroad. We will have the opportunity to gain insight into their design process, professional values, and how they find balance between their different aspects of their professional and personal experiences. Panelists participating in this event have been invited to share their strategy of, for addressing a range of topics such as technology, the environment, materials, 
and fabrication within the context of their collective experience as female practitioner professional. They will address their design entrepreneurship approach and, as paved, uh, as, as, and how it has paved their career so far. Our first presenter, we have two presenters today, Sushi Reddy, who is the founder of Ready Made Architecture and Design, and we have Mariana Ibanez, uh, uh, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA, and co-founder of Ibanez, Kim. We will start with Sushi, Sushi Reddy, founder of Ready Made Architecture and Design. Uh, she's the founding principle of Ready Made. Uh, the guiding principle of the practice is form follows feeling, a design ethos informed by neuroaesthetics, the study of how the brain responds to the design of our surroundings. The strong belief that good design calibrated carefully to the human possibly influences well being, creativity, and productivity and informs all projects from conception to detail. In 2019, Reddy was appointed Plime Dis Distinguished Professor at the University of Illinois in, of Architecture, uh, Urbana, where she works focused on contemporary architectural experience through the lens of neuroaesthetics neurophenomenology and sensory design. Reddy has lectured in firms, uh, on her firm's work in numerous venues, including Salk Institute for Academy of Neuroscience for Architects New Annual Conference, the University of Illinois, and the University of Wisconsin. She sits on the board of the Design Trust for Public Space, Storefront for the Arts and Architecture, and Madame Architect. She is the Dean's Board of Advisors at Detroit Mercy School of Architecture. Welcome, Sushi. We are delighted that you can join us tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Trudy. Um, it's an honor to be here, actually, and um, to be part of this um, very incredible um, lecture series that you're curating. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you a little bit about um, perspectives, um, because I think they influence so much of, of where we come from and what we do in the world. And it was um, actually um, uh, very interesting when we spoke yesterday and you, you framed the conversation within this lens for us, um, for Mariana and me to really present our work. So um, I will, if it's okay, um, start sharing my screen and share some of the projects and some of the thoughts behind them. Um, I'm going to watch the clock because I know I have 25 minutes. Yes. Two seconds. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah? Yes. Okay. So um, I begin with a title slide uh, that actually comes from one of my uh, favorite horror films, but uh, not to you know, express my experience in architecture as part of being in a horror film, but to really, because this um, particular scene has always stuck in my mind. And as an immigrant, as a, a female practitioner, I've always felt that it's been really important for me to have kind of a liminal perspective. I always stand on the threshold of things, looking in, looking out, developing a, a perspective that I think can belong to both worlds and to all worlds. And to some degree, I really feel that as architects, this is what we do. Our work is rather boundaryless, and we're always looking to encompass uh, many, uh, many Can everybody hear me? Okay, sorry, it said I was muted by the host there for a second. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, um, so I wanted to start by explaining a little bit of this idea of form follows feeling. 
Um, I was raised in Chennai, India, and when I was about 10 years old, um, I remember having maybe the first epiphany of my life, which was that my house was actually changing the person that I was, that it was making me very different than my friends. And I don't know, I can't explain to you as a child how I knew that, but I did kind of know it. And that um, experience has actually guided me to create spaces that I think actually come from a space of mediating how we experience them. Um, so the first project I'd like to show you in this series, sorry, give me one second, it's not moving. Hmm. It's fine a second ago. Let me see. Okay, there we go. Is um, our latest project, which is a flagship retail store for um, Google. I think it's a company you all know. Um, in New York City. And this, of course, is uh, an, an amazing commission to be um, designing something on a world stage that is the first of its kind. And the approach that I took to it was, um, as you can see, something quite different than what you might expect from a normal technology store. This isn't a world of aspiration. This is a world of um, inclusivity, of making people feel welcomed, making people feel like it's a warm space that they can enter, um, that the materials were very democratic and very easy for people to understand. Um, we designed uh, uh, the space for an experience of both uh, the product as well as um, the interaction that humans have with technology, which is something that really fascinates me and that I think is a space for um, a kind of a more hybrid interaction than we have engaged with it in the past. And um, the space itself is set up so that um, we look at it from um, a, a place of discovery. And this was also something that was very important to me as an inclusive kind of idea, because this idea of wonder, I think is something that's open to everyone. Um, and it's really something that brings everyone in. So um, for a retail store that was a very long space, um, we actually managed to maximize the storage and the display space, but also to create a kind of a sculptural element in the middle of it that allowed people to feel as if they were at home in the store, that this was their space, they're allowed to be here, they're allowed to experience um, everything that's in it and enjoy it. And that the space is actually designed for discovery and enjoyment. Um, so it's very playful. Um, there's a lot of interesting technology that was developed with the very talented teams that I worked with, um, where there's a whole lot of imagery that can move in and out. We have some transparent screens and these beautiful experience boxes that are along the windows that allow you to see not just the object, but through the object and learn more about it. And this again was an aspect of inclusivity that I think in a world that can tend to be opaque to a lot of people allows you to really come in. Um, accessibility was extremely important in this project. We made sure that every single element was designed to be accessible to everyone and that none of it would feel either intimidating or overwhelming, but enticing and um, bringing you in. So um, I'm sort of sliding, you know, going through the slides a, a little bit quickly because I think I have a longer lecture than you might want me to give. Um, but um, it was a question of showcasing product in a way that was warm, in a way that made you feel like you could touch things um, in a space that also made you feel like every surface was okay to be touched. Um, I should mention this, the, the stores also um, has one, uh, one of the highest ratings for sustainability in the world. It is a lead platinum retail store for its size. That's very unusual. And every material in here um, shows um, sensitivity and care for the planet, for climate, um, everything from the flooring being made of recycled water bottles to the wood being certified um, uh, and used carefully. Um, the next project uh, that I will take you to is um, a residence that we designed with uh, an artist whose name you will recognize, Ai Weiwei, who has also been very concerned with issues of immigration and of, of, of nationality. Um, but this was actually a very different kind of project that we worked on together, it was a residential project. And um, 
One thing I want to point out before I get too far is one of the interesting things about the kind of practice I've been able to develop is the fact that it encompasses many different fields, whether they are um, uh, interior architecture, exterior architecture, interior design, um, art installations. Um, and this has evolved over the last sort of almost 20 years of my practice. And this is also a form of inclusivity that I want to put out there as something that's really available for everyone should we want to experience that. This idea of being put inside a box never uh, never enticed me too much. So um, the range of projects that I will be showing you will be quite different one from the other. Um, so this is a, a smaller residential project. And here it is about really including the landscape within the experience of the architecture. It really is all about the landscape and about being in nature. And particularly with this last year, it has been you know, where all of us have felt the need um, for nature in our lives. Um, this particular project, um, which took a hexagonal plan and extruded it in section to generate um, the addition to this house and perch it over hillside is really set up to maximize views to nature and to really make you feel like you are part of your surroundings. This was very important to me. And I bring out these concepts because they tie into the theme in which you're, you have titled this lecture series, but in the ways in which we can actually do them in physical space and for all kinds of people. Um, the third project that I will show you, well, sorry, that went back a little bit, um, is, uh, it's called a space for being, and this project is a little explains a little bit about um, our research into this idea of neuroaesthetics that Trudy mentioned, um, which is a field um, that's about 15 years old, um, and it looks into really how humans experience um, space and experiences, um, artistic or otherwise. And um, it, to illustrate this, uh, we designed an installation in Milan um, a few years ago where we designed three different rooms that were exactly the same um, uh, function. And um, people entered each room. And before they entered each room, um, they were given a band. This project was designed um, in collaboration with uh, Google, who designed this band and Muto, which is a furniture company, and uh, the International Arts and Minds Lab at uh, Johns Hopkins Brain Sciences Institute. Um, so the point of the installation was really to show you that design matters, that space matters, that your experience and your relationship to it matters. Um, so it begins with a band that Google designed, which monitors um, uh, four different characteristics in your body. And people went through different spaces. They went through, first of all, um, kind of a, a quieting space that sort of, you know, um, set the tone or cleared the palette, you know, for the for the next experience that came along and went into three different rooms. So this first room that you see um, was much more earthy. It had softer curves, lines. The lighting was very, um, very subtle. And people were invited to stay in these rooms for 10 minutes at a time, not talking to each other, not looking at their phones, which in these days is a huge accomplishment. Um, and in order to get a read, to see where their body was most at ease and to be able to reflect that back to them so that they could also understand that for themselves and really see that design is not as subjective as we make it out to be, that it is really a very crucial tool in um, how we feel both in our environment and about ourselves. So this room uh, you know, had all these natural materials, a beautiful tapestry um, that was made out of you know, um, the dyes of flowers and, and you know, a wool of goats that were actually being um, saved from being extinct. And you know, there had, had a real character to it. This was an installation, but it was actually had real materials, real, um, real everything. It did not feel like a temporary space at all. Um, and even you know, my favorite cactus, who was about eighty years old, that I brought into one of the rooms because I thought it needed the presence of an elder. Um, and so this was the first room. The second room, hang on, 
was a very different story. So this one was about being in a very different environment, again, in the same same function, nothing very different about it. Um, and I curated also the experiences within these rooms. So in the first room, we were reading about cooking and poetry and textures. And this room um, was filled with a childhood uh, favorite of mine, um, pop-up books, so that I could, you know, and there was music and there were scents in the rooms um, that could enhance these experiences. Um, so the bright colors, the lights, uh, the directionality, the playfulness still, which was something that is, you know, is and continues to be important to me in my work, um, led us to the third room, which was a very different experience in terms of being textural, of having the light come down on you from up above, um, of giving people a space to relax. And there's a short film coming up about this. So I'm going to rush through this a little bit and then let you hear um, the whole story. So when you come out, you come out into this kind of space where you take off your band and the information is decoded for you. So it was very important to us that the way that the data was also reflected back to people was in a very human form, that it didn't look like numbers and graphs, but that it was represented as a picture that you could understand it. Um, and uh, there were several sort of beautiful moments through this experience. I remember um, there was a, a couple of friends of mine who came out of one of the experiences and compared their cards and they were both flaring at the same time. And it was because they had enjoyed the same thing at the same time. It was when they were smiling at each other. And it's this really beautiful sense of how human connection is actually reflected um, in our daily lives and our experiences. And if design can actually bring that forward, I think um, we're doing what we should be doing. Um, but this project actually, and I'm, I'm, I'm lingering on this a little bit because this is actually the core of my thinking from before I came across this, this field of inquiry and taking it forward into the past. And it actually informs all of the work um, forward and backward. So at the end of it, we also had a lounge where people sat down and could understand more about what they had just been through and left with um, an image of what they had just gone through. Um, so this film will tell you all about it. The way this project is unusual is that we are actually pursuing a principle. I really believe that form follows feeling, and feeling is really what space and architecture are about. Space actually affects people. Design matters. It's why we spend the time making the decisions we do. Those things that we as designers intuit, neuroscience is now proving have an effect. Google created an exhibition that is showing design's impact on our biology. The way that I explain neuroaesthetics, it's really simple. It's basically how your brain changes on the arts. When you have a heightened aesthetic experience, like a piece of music, a sunrise, things that really elevate your everyday experiences, they change you. They change your biology, they change your mood, they change your emotion. I called Suchi Reddy and I said, taking the neuroaesthetic principles, could you create three different rooms that would evoke different responses? The goal is to see how people resonate with space and to really find out whether what they think they resonate with is what their body is actually resonating with. 
we respond to the aesthetics of our environment, whether we realize it or not. The band can demonstrate with data from the sensors that, that actually is happening. Heart activity, respiratory activity, skin temperature, skin conductance, we figure out from the data which room is the one that feels the calmest or the most at ease for people. Does your physiology feel most peaceful? I think it's what people are searching for. The space between the notes, the place where they can come and just be. The interiors where we work and where we live have a deep impact on our well-being. We've always known that and believed in it, but we haven't been able to quantify it and prove it. You enter a space and it's like, I, I like it, but why? This is about data used as a mirror back to yourself. Data is just a bunch of numbers, and we wanted to make it artistic in its expression. It can be really hard to put an aesthetic experience into words. But suddenly, by combining science and technology, we get a new language. We selected yeah. room two as the room that we were the most calm in. Maybe a watercolor can tell more than a thousand words. Technology has the ability to help you know yourself better. The problems of the future are only going to become more complicated solutions have to happen in this collaboration of technology, the arts, and science. Um, so from there, I'd like you to take you to a whole um, other side of my practice, um, which is uh, an installation um, and um, architectural installation, art installation aspect of it. Um, this project um, was called X and it's um, took place in Times Square. And uh, we won a competition uh, to answer a brief and we created a place that was meant to visualize what love and justice could look like in our society. And um, there's also a short film that follows this, which has some very um, personal, um, reflections in it. So I'll leave, I'll leave that for you to discover, but I will take you through some of the images um, of the space. Um, so, you know, we were inspired obviously by the idea that this is a melting pot. This is a, this is a place where everyone comes together and this idea of inclusion in this place where um, as immigrants or anyone else, um, we're invited to feel at home and as one of many. Um, where we belong. Uh, it was really important to me to create uh, an installation that would not only stand out in scale, but also create a human-sized space that you could actually occupy underneath it. Um, so it offers you something as well as, um, you know, giving you something to think about. And because this was about love, part of the brief was to generate somewhere a heart shape in the sculpture and I did it by um, uh, through tectonics, really, um, introducing a circle into two intersecting planes and seeing what that showed us and inscribing that um, with this idea that into difference, when you add equality, you find love. Um, so these are some other images of the sculpture, which was made of um, uh, steel and aluminum, and it reflected basically its surroundings, which I also think is, you know, these, these themes of being an immigrant come through in so many different ways, but I think in some ways we sort of incorporate these ideas and then they come out in our work and then you're like, yeah, I think I know what that means to reflect my surroundings, but in a certain way, you know, where it's through my lens and it's me as I fit into this landscape. So... Um, this is another short film that I will play um, that tells you a little bit about my trajectory and um, to the making of this work. The brief for the project was this quote from Dr. Cornell West, which talks about justice and love, both in a private and a public context. 
these issues certainly have been up close and front and center to people like me of color and immigrants, and people who don't have the same opportunities that other people have. And so how do you actually translate that into a way in which you can bring that idea across to people and make it something interesting and exciting to engage in? I grew up in the city of Madras in South India, which is now called Chennai. When I first came to this country, my first experience with racism was a shock. I didn't even recognize it. I didn't regret it at all, but the first firm that I got an internship in was an all-black firm. They were willing to hire me. And then when my second internship was in a white firm that was mostly male, I remember sitting there and thinking, why am I not getting anything interesting to do? And then I look around and I see that the white guys were my age, who I could tell were not as interested in the work as I was, were getting the projects and I wasn't. That was my first epiphany of racism. When you recognize the limitations, I mean, this is why I think, you know, being an architect is such an amazing thing, because in essence, what we are doing is always dealing with limitations. We're always dealing with limitations. We're always dealing with the difficulties, with the challenges. That actually is the material that we work with. In my architecture, I always like to go back to stripping things down to the basics, to really understanding how little can you use to say how much. And so when I saw the brief, I was incredibly excited about it. New York to me was the first time I had actually felt at home in this country that I was desperately trying to call my own. And the site being this melting point, being these crossroads, the brief being about love, we came across these two different planes and what happens when you cross them and then when you insert a symbol like a circle or an ellipse that implied this heart-shaped icon. It's the magic of geometry where you do these things and then they reveal themselves. We really wanted to create not just a moment or an object that's viewed from all sides, but something that was a space that could be experienced. I felt like we had arrived at an economy of material and shape and form to express this concept. At the intersection of difference and division, when you insert justice, equality, and democracy, love is created. And so it really was this idea of into difference, add equality, find love. That became the formula and the principle for the sculpture. On the one hand, it's this very tall X that, you know, is a big enough shape that stands out within this urban space. But at the same time, the bottom half of it is the size of a teepee, you know, it's a tent. It allows you to feel intimate within that space. So people got married under this. They kissed under it. They created dances under this thing. There were so many things that happened and part of the beauty of doing something that you unleash into the public space is really see how other people interpret what you do. Form and the experience of architecture and art has the ability to shape a person, not just emotionally and culturally, but also from their physical well-being. In my culture, we have a concept called Advaita, which means you are always part of a whole. You don't have the sense of difference to somebody who might have a different opinion than you, a different orientation than you, a different color than you, a different language than you. And as architects, it's the biggest privilege in the world to generate spaces that can actually inspire people to want to be more of themselves. Um, you know, I always get a little emotional when I see that, but um, 
the the last thing that I will end with is um, on the theme of being an immigrant. Um, another sculpture that is um, coming up. Um, this is just a sneak peek um, for everybody. Um, this is going up in Canada, and this is specifically the brief for this sculpture was about the experience of being an immigrant. And um, what we created was really this sense of of rising, of twisting and turning, and modulating and being flexible, but coming back to your roots and that creates a space that you walk through. Um, so that's really the idea. And so before I quit, um, I would like to actually mention um, my amazing studio of incredibly diverse people who have always been that way with me without whom I wouldn't be here. Um, so thank you and thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Fushia. That was extremely inspiring and emotional at, at as well for me. So I really am very excited to see the work presented by you. Uh, we will continue our lecture uh, with uh, our professor Farzana Gandhi, who is the associate professor here at NYT School of Architecture and Design. And she will present Mariana and, and, and lead us uh, into her lecture as well. Thank you, Farsana. Thank you, Sufi. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, thank you uh, again to uh, our Dean, uh, Maria Provellini and the Lectures and Events Committee for having uh, had the opportunity to host this event. Um, and Suchi, that was an incredible presentation. I am looking forward to the discussion that will follow. Um, I have the absolute pleasure now to uh, also introduce Mariana Ibanez. Uh, she is an Argentinian architect involved in practice, academia, and research. She is an associate professor and also now chair in the Department of Architecture and Urban Design at UCLA. And she's co-founder of Ibanez Kim, a genre-defiant practice that works with sensate materials, atmospheres, and new media to generate architecture, objects, and cities. Their work focuses on the disciplinary core of architecture and its growing periphery with a focus on the relationship between technology, culture, and the environment. Before joining UCLA, Mariana taught at Harvard University Graduate School of Design for over a decade and for the past four years at the MIT School of Architecture and Planning. As an author, Mariana has published two edited volumes, Paradigms in Computing by Rutledge and Organization or Design by A plus T. She has also written numerous articles and chapters for Wiley and Sons, Harvard Design Magazine, Actar, Rutledge, and others. Her work has been exhibited widely at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Maxi Museum in Rome, the National Art Museum in Beijing, with projects also including work for the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, DC, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Biennale in Seoul. Mariana received her Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Buenos Aires and her Master of Architecture from the Architectural Association in London. Uh, and her lecture today is titled Sometimes Solid. So with that, Mariana, thank you for being here and I pass the mic to you. Thank you, Fartana, for that introduction. Let me get to share my screen. Um, Can you see my screen? Yes, that's good. All right, I'll start. So thanks again, Farsana, for the introduction, but thank you also to Trudy, to Pablo and Tom, who originally had contacted me uh, to give a talk in the school. It's been long due, and I'm very, very excited to be here. I'm very excited to be here with Suchi as well. Um, I'm going to show work as well, probably me too. I have too many slides, 
So I might not go through the whole presentation since I'm also very much looking forward to the conversation at the end. Um, I was gonna start by saying that when I give lectures, um, I have like different kinds of talks and sometimes I just show a collection of projects um, either because they're new and I wanna figure out how to talk about them or I show kind of longer arcs of work to show a trajectory. And in some cases like today, I have a prompt to react to. And today I actually had two prompts. Maybe after hearing Alessandro speak, I would say I had three prompts and I'm gonna figure out how the lecture sort of responds to all of them. The first one is this title, Inclusive Design Trajectories, the Female Voices in uh, Architecture and Design. And I was thinking that um, I really never conceptualized or produced my work with an awareness of um, the female lens, the female gaze, the immigrant lens, the immigrant gaze, although I'm all of those things. And often uh, now, thankfully less now, but uh, still pretty pervasive. We found ourselves being sometimes the only female in a room or clearly the one with an accent and all things that um, I never necessarily felt propelled me or delayed me. And perhaps as I get older, I become more aware of at which points in the road these became an obstacle to overcome and sometimes used to leverage uh, specific aspects of the work. What I definitely can clearly identify and share, and this was always clear to me, is that I have had the opportunity to, opportunity to work with incredible female role models and mentors. And um, that has made a difference because they normalized to me what it meant to have a female in a position of leadership, either intellectual or of other kinds, and effectively in seats of power. So obviously being able to be supported by this kind of character um, unavoidably makes a difference in how we act, how we react, and how we imagine we can build our careers. Um, the second uh, thing that I had today as something to react to was this collection of three words that was sent to me when I was invited to give the talk. Um, uh, I guess these words I read them as containers for themes that can be associated with some of the work that we do in the office and through research projects. And these three words, fabrication, materials, and tectonics, they made me think about categories and how we name things and how these words actually connect, not only with projects, but, the, but also with the conceptual frameworks and core agendas that drive some of the work. So I took the liberty to change that, to make it perhaps more connected to what I think is central to the work. Um, so I think, again, those associations are better represented by these related yet critically different terms. So I'm just going to go over them one by one. So for the first one, I would say that if fabrication has been associated over the past 20 years with processes that involve machines to manipulate materials and create form. Within our work, the process of producing things is definitely a hybrid or messy often in that it involves a combination of machine produced and manual operations. But more importantly, I associated immediately fabrication with the idea of precision and with the idea of tight tolerances that comes with machines, things that can be measured and they can be quantified. And why we primarily work through different aspects of digital production and computation, I would say that for us, approximation is a better term to fit the work rather than precision. Uh, given that things like change and time and other processes of transformation are always involved. So again, machine precision is not really the goal of our work. And sometimes the processes associated with fabrication almost rely on that type of precision. Uh, for the second term, materials, I would say that the relationship between architectural and urban elements 
and the effects that they produce and how they interact and transform the environment, interact with and transform the environment involve a series of variables like atmosphere and the perhaps myriad of elements that fit in that category, elements that are also bound by the loss of physics and the loss of thermodynamics for sure, but they are maybe not necessarily associated with materials of construction or architectural materials. So in this case, matter, I think, feels, fits better the bill. And as for the last one, for tectonics, as uh, Tarsana said in the introduction, we explicitly place our work in the relationship between core disciplinary issues and a growing periphery. So in relationship to tectonics, uh, which I understand both as a technical and also a discursive term, augmented tectonics is a project that I've been developing for quite some time. And at the core, the idea uh, that I will touch on many projects throughout the presentation is how to use conventional materials in unconventional ways. So this is how I sort of renamed or rebranded uh, this prompt that I was given uh, for today. And hence the title, Sometimes Solid, uh, that hopefully will become clear in a moment. Um, this is slide is a little bit of a catch-all. A catch-all, as you heard in the introduction, I am a co-founder with Simon Kim of the um, Ivania Skin Practice. We both teach, we both write, we both lead research projects, and we both meet at Ivania Skin to design things. This structure has always been instrumental in supporting the connection between ideas and research with projects. Interestingly enough for today, I'm gonna to think about this later. I don't think I included a single one of our buildings. I think it's mostly research projects and installation work. We uh, believe in the importance of keeping uh, at the foreground the, the work that we do in the context of experimentation and figure out how that then makes it to what perhaps others would consider more conventional forms of architecture. We uh, often work collaboratively. We work across scales and mediums. Uh, we work with artists, with roboticists, with material scientists, with mathematicians, with planners. We often work with other architects. Uh, and we also work with city officials and people from industry, with developers, and, and of course, with clients. But the premise that is important for us is that the knowledge that emerges from all of those collaborations and the skills of work and the ideas and the techniques uh, can be claimed as a site for architectural speculation. They can be found to have traces in the architectural discipline and they can also help advance it or produce new knowledge. So for today, I'm gonna actually show four sections. Three are using the themes that I introduced earlier on. And first a super brief uh, commentary on tradition. Um, so as I said before, our work ranges from what anybody would consider architecture, I would categorize that as buildings, to projects that operate on the boundaries uh, and of what um, other people outside our discipline might consider architecture, uh, which I think is, would be widely accepted in this room and it borders artistic practices, engineering, object design, so on and so forth. So again, I'm pretty sure that the audience in this room is very amicable to this concept. We are not the first ones to do this, but I wanted to introduce some projects and ideas and lineages that we are connected to, and perhaps a few people that we consider our um, historical friends. So I present this segment of history very purposefully in a way that architecture has foregrounded in more or less degree the issue of technology in its arguments, in its representation, and in its production and evolving from a stage of imaging technology uh, to its application in the production of materials and spaces. And as technology becomes more available, uh, the possibility of embedding technology in the projects themselves. So in this slide, um, some friends that I'm sure are your friends too, Hans Hollein, Cedric Price. These are projects that emerge from looking at machines, at new materials, advancements in industry, perhaps the space race, NASA, sci-fi. Um, and in that sense, just a brief mention to the Philips Pavilion that has been a very important reference for us for some of our work. 
uh, in the way that it uh, at that time presented a very novel collaboration. I'll speak about that in a second. So for those of you, maybe the students in the audience that might not know this project, this is the Philips Pavilion. It was produced for the World Expo in 58. The slogan for the expo was between utopia and reality. And Philips, who wanted to have a hallmark building to announce their dominance in technology, they invited Le Corbusier to do the project. But it was really Yanis Senakis, who was a young engineer in Corbusier's office, that designed the project. And Senakis was also a composer, and he discarded his poses idea of a bottle or a vessel, and he replaced it with a dynamic mathematical surface of, that represented Kisandi of sound. But as I said before, for me, what is important to highlight is the very dense, interesting collaboration uh, of the people that work in this pavilion that involve the architects, a composer, a film director, a graphic designer, a structural engineer, all the designers and technologies from Philips, uh, which were testing how to embed technology within materials and spaces to create fully immersive sensorial and atmospheric experiences and environments. Um, in all of those examples, and also in these, the role of the human body and its relationship to space was also explored. In this slide, you see Donna Haraway, Nove 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 Nove, Susana Soares, and the clear reference to bodies that might be different, to transhuman conditions, to interfaces that are related to our physical world, but also to immaterial aspects of uh, experience and the way in which we imagine how human bodies might relate to other types of spaces and perhaps even other types of species. So again, in all of these projects, I think what was important is the latent idea that the environment is not a stable and fixed condition and that both the subject and the environment are interconnected, dependent, perhaps even derivative of one another and in a constant state of transformation. So now I'll move to my work, but that introduction hopefully um, sort of creates this type of conceptual framework that has generated a lot of our work. In the first cluster of projects are un, uh, gathered under the topic of making with a central idea of transformation, uh, examples of phys physical computing as processes of input output that connects modeling, simulation, matter, behaviors, effects, and perhaps a feedback loop between physical and digital environments. The first project is the Philadelphia Mass. It's a known project for us, but current in the methodologies we use. Every year in the office, we work on a self-initiated speculative project that tests potential connections between architecture interventions and the urban effects when introduced um, as large-scale systems. I love that Alessandro spoke about strange creatures. We work with characters a lot. And this project owes a lot to many of Hadoff's projects in how uh, an architectural element is treated as a character and all of those things that, um, that afford us. So the MASP is a multi-agent project for the city of Philadelphia, again, full of strange creatures. And here the focus of the research was to understand how we cognitively map our environment via references. And, um, if you have visited Philadelphia, you will know that for a large metropolitan area, it has a striking amount of empty lots that are distributed throughout the city, regardless of real estate value, and with a vacancy that has increased significantly since the 2008 economic crisis. And this is a problem that has not yet really been resolved. So um, basically, with this project, we were seeking to operate very opportunistically using these vacant lots and these architectural agents to introduce cultural activities throughout the city that would be open to everybody, offering an alternative to the historical trail in Philadelphia and even to the figure of the museum. Um, so we selected a few lots and based on where they located and their immediate context, we created this grand narrative of a mask or a theatrical reimagining of the city where architectural police were interacting among their, themselves and with the inhabitants of the city. Each character was given a name. He was uh, assigned a, form, a formal logic like monolithic or striated or linear or crystalline, which are the four that you have in front of you and a medium of expression or behavior perhaps like light, sound or kinetics, for example. 
Um, each character was fitted with a fiducial marker, which is used to track its position and its relationship to other characters to connect the physical intervention, the analog representation, and the digital realm. So this is a very basic principle in how physical computing is used in many of our projects, which you might see uh, reappear in the presentation. I hope, I don't know if the movies are working, but there should be some things um, active uh, down there. So this is a character that was imagined to have kinetic properties and the prototype was part of a larger investigation that looked into the reconfiguration of solid figures. And in this case, using the principle of a hinge dissection. And I'm showing this character because that was used um, <clears throat> to generate this project uh, that emerged from research. But here we had the opportunity to test this at a one-to-one -one scale. So a few years ago, when the office was invited to participate in the Young Architects program uh, that some of you might know as the PS1 program organized by MoMA in New York, we just wanted to test that formal logic as a tectonic proposition. So the project here was inspired by European plazas and colonnades that organize what we call the spectacle of urban life, you know, stand typologically to so their relationship between a center and a perimeter. And here, in order to produce that relationship, we use a Duden-A dissection to transform the triangular patio of the PS1 site into a courtyard. And then we deployed a series of units through this new uh, proposed edge. Now the units were resolved as a collection of tetrahedrons that combine in various ways to create tree-like figures. And the idea here is that a very simple base module was repeated and modified to generate a very wide range of options for um, seating and can canopy. Um, we also use the character narrative as a means to differentiate in each structure or unit from one another. And this was to support the program requested uh, by MoMA for those of you that don't know, this is a structure that comes up during the summer and they require things like a bar and shaded seating areas and DJ spaces and so on and so forth. So we created this one-to-one um, -one prototype. Well, redundant, I would say all prototypes are one-to-one, -one. but here we were testing the structural performance, the formal plasticity, the assembly strategies, the material definition. And in this case, we work with Hanif Kara at AKT uh, to design the project uh, and again to fulfill this idea that with one base form multiple configurations could be achieved uh, and then we could quickly assemble and quickly disassemble and here you see a view of the complete courtyard and this is what the spatial experience would be so as I mentioned before we regularly collaborate with artists <clears throat> and this was a project we did with the carbon dance theater company to produce a cybernetic performance between humans and machines. <clears throat> Excuse me. And here we were involved in the design of the robotic arms, the contents that you see behind the dancers on the screen, and the wearable controllers used by the dancers uh, throughout the play that actually had um, feedback between these three systems. Um, the arms created actually a space that read as a room within the larger room of the stage. But they also um, were dancers in the play that very much were part of the choreography and interacted with the other dancers. So what happened in the physical world of humans was connected to what happens in the physical world of machines and in the digital world of computers. Um, this project came right after MoMA and it's also a hinging project on the most basic level. And in this case, the robot arms were um, designed by adapting a system using modular robotics. And here I would mention Mark Kim, who's the director of the Modular Robotics Lab and who's a longtime collaborator of um, our office and a co-director of the Immersive Kinematics Lab. And he does this type Modular of robots are capable of a variety of configurations and modes and of locomotion, we were including bike and in how and we could walk. use the performance space to adapt some of these systems to perhaps make architecture in a variety of situations. As we were um, this is what, again, the stage for us is useful. Uh, this system called CK Bot is made of 15 modules forward. arranged in three clusters of um, But definitely, we want to test this at one to one. So, we use that same modular uh, robotic system used in the performance and in the robots that you just saw to produce this project which is the poly house, which is the deployable shelter system. And here the idea was to find a way 
to uh, produce shelter uh, quickly in different terrains. So we imagine disaster scenario areas, public performance uh, opportunities, uh, occupying public space temporarily, and so on and so forth. So we've been working for a very long time on a full-scale prototype, but hopefully I'll have it soon in Electra. Um, I don't know how I'm doing with time, but so I'll start speaking a little bit faster. In the matter and assemblies uh, category, I'll just show a few projects and uh, that are done with different materials. This one that you see on the screen is APOC. It's a project that started as a monocoque capsule and it was built as the result of winning a competition organized by the city of Toronto. And it was also to produce small shelters in public spaces. We built it with standard size plywood sheets that forced the monocoque to be panelized, transforming the geometry from a single continuous surface to a two layer structure uh, that was resolved with independent panels. And here's a good example of some of the ideas that I spoke about in my introduction about the difficulty to actually digitally model these kinds of projects and how much we rely on the physical reaction of materials. So sometimes we find ourselves in situations where we actually never have a final digital model. Uh, we have a lot of models through which we simulate and then we have a piece built in the world that doesn't really match one-to-one -one what happens in the screen and vice versa. And usually also with the pieces, we learn a lot of things. So in this case, material performance and form were very much related to the scale at which we built these things. Uh, these panels are a compliant mechanism. Uh, and this means that it was um, cold bending only was used to achieve the curvature and the shape of the apertures were directly related to how much curvature could be achieved within each panel. So here the relationship of the size of the panel and how much we wanted to bend it to create this closed figure was a lot of trial and error. And those models that I showed you earlier were not capable of simulating the full scale. So each one of these dimensions was critical to build a piece. Um, the investigation of the types of effects, the overlay produced, the two layers on the assembly continue in other projects. Uh, this, the year um, that, that APOC was produced, somehow we were obsessed with wood and we won a series of competitions to build small projects, both in public spaces and in gallery spaces. And so we were pretty much obsessed, obsessed about the material and the kinds of things we could do. This one was a competition uh, organized by the Boston Society of Architects. It was called Smaller Than a Building, Bigger Than a Bread Box. And in this case, the interior space completely transformed the fabrication process, the assembly method, and the experience of the piece. So here we use wood as structure and as veneer. Um, and the project was conceived as the, the most basic architectural element. It was a wall. But the idea is that this wall would transform through its line to become a sequence of four conditions uh, that created a solid uh, a space inside, a void that could be occupied, and an intersection. Uh, the question was how to articulate all of these variations through material and formal continuity. And in this case, also, we have inside the room an interactive component. It was a chamber of sound that received occupants with messages on the principles of architecture. We had seven randomized recordings by recognized architects on uh, disciplinary histories that were pretty recognizable. Each recording lasted for seven seconds. And at the end of the message, like a bright light would blind the visitor and signal it was time for them to leave. And in this case, the interest was placed in the invisibility of technology, which is not always the case when we develop interactive pieces. And materially and formally, the project is related to a longer investigation where we use conics and curves to produce these uh, kinds of figures and models. Um, this investigation also produced this piece, um, which was called the Minister of uh, Arts and Culture. It was also the result of a competition to build a piece for a public event, uh, for the Play Day event in the London D in Boston. And here, I think, actually, the driving question was posed also by Maria in her introduction, which is, who has access to technology and what is it used for? Here, the technology is visible. It's literally screaming at you. And we created these cones that are fitted with either a recording device or a speaker. 
And this is actually the mess that looks on the inside, but I think sometimes it's interesting to show how actually low tech these technologies sometimes are. Uh, the project was inspired by one Parwise secret catcher. And in this case, we catch secrets and we amplify and distort the message such that when the message is broadcasted to the world, you really don't know uh, if the voice is female, male, young, old, but it's simply a human experience. Um, I will show two very short and different projects that I just wanted to put on the table to talk about other aspects of technology and research uh, that present a different idea of matter. This is Shumi. It's a speaker made out of mushrooms. And here we wanted to explore the idea of decay, how we can design obsolescence in our projects and imagine a different idea of material life cycles. Uh, so here you see Shumi a few weeks later and show me a few more weeks later, once it kind of rots and is no longer usable. So now we're on to longer timelines and thinking how this might apply to larger scale, longer than a few weeks kinds of projects um, in, uh, when we think about our buildings. And this is CloudClock, it's a wearable environment. And this piece focused on thinking about the relationship between our bodies, space, and the way we relate to other bodies and their individual spaces. So this is what the hardware looks like, and this is what it produces. It's a cloud that builds a veil around you, such that you can decide what others see of you. Gender, race, mood. Cloud Clock allows you to grade and change how and how much of you is seen by the world. And then I'm gonna show one more project in this last section. Uh, in a sense, too, it's about the idea of using common materials in uncommon ways, but it is also about connecting research across scales of work. Um, it starts with a rock. This is a natural rock that we found outside of our office. And then this one is one we made. We made this one with cast concrete. And then we build a family of them and we layer them in rubber and we fitted them with conductors and we plug them to the computer. And when you plug rocks to the computer, you begin to discover properties and potential you didn't know rocks could have. And in this case, vibration is what we were producing as and the vibrations became our input. And uh, these vibrations is what could come from a busy road, from loud, loud sounds, from active landscapes, from the activities of people. And as you know, the moment that you're able to turn this into data, you can do anything with it. Uh, so what happens is actually quite simple. Uh, the vibrations of the rocks are turned into signals, and then the output now, what you see on the screen, was on the screen is was just to uh, visualize the translation and then to produce a project. So here the rocks are used in the context of another one of our large-scale speculative projects. This one is called Automotive where each material unit is imagined as a building placed into a larger structure. And the project was um, trying to revisit some of OMA's reflections on Euralil, where a large structure can serve as a new ground for future development in the city. So this might or might not be directly related to the ground of the city, meaning that it can benefit and interact with its structure, its typologies, infrastructure, but also create a productive sense of autonomy. Um, uh, there is a lot of creativity that goes into getting funding for these kinds of projects. So basically we take every opportunity we can to develop them further. And in this case, I have two more slides. This is part of the last Seoul Architecture Biennale. We get invited to be part of the collective city exhibitions. And in this case, automotive became the heterotopial. We were interested in exploring Foucault's idea of worlds within worlds and using uh, notions of the familiar and the strange and the elements of the automotive were further developed to express new material and so spatial behaviors. Um, okay, I'm gonna have, I, for some reason, Emma's voice is not coming out, so I'm gonna try to narrate the video. Here, what we see is an AR interface. 
um, that will basically give access to the visitors to inter through this interface to project layers that cannot be contained in the space of a drawing. These layers of information include variables like sound, distortion, color changes, atmospheric changes, changes that are based on time. And in this process, all of the layers are necessary to connect making, matter, and the tectonic and experiential outcomes of the project. So this was as much an art piece as it was an experience. And we took advantage of a medium that allows us to introduce things that are uh, emerging from things that we recognize as part of the real world, but definitely different. And this idea of difference uh, and how we begin to normalize difference is something that reappears in a lot of our work. So I'm gonna stop there because I think I'm way over time. So I'll just uh, leave it there. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mariana, for all of that inspiring work. Uh, so I think what we'll do is uh, start off with a few questions um, uh, to kick off a little bit of a discussion between you and Suchi. Um, you know, already we see such parallels between your work, uh, you know, whether looking at uh, the relationship of architecture and technology and biology and sort of uh, neuroscience uh, to a very human-centered approach, um, you know, looking at spaces that inspire uh, interaction and discovery, um, that spaces that are really accessible by all um, and sensory environments that are accessible by all. I'm also very interested um, specifically in, in that both of you have a commitment to um, sort of the making of your work, right? Whether it is um, through uh, the actual fabrication and the understanding of how things are put together um, for you, Mariana, or Suchi, in terms of the materiality um, and sort of building with the earth and the tactility of um, the spaces that you produce. And I'm wondering if you might comment um, whether any of that comes from uh, early experiences and thinking of uh, growing up in countries that are not the United States, right? So Mariana for you in Argentina, uh, Suchi in India, I think embedded in countries like these, uh, from my own experience, you know, making is really part of culture. Whether you see artisans on the street, whether you see, you know, people uh, making buildings uh, all around you. Um, and I'm wondering if any of your early childhood or early experiences may have shaped that interest for you. Um, I can start with that one. Um, you know, it's so interesting, right, when people say, how has your experience shaped you? Because in some ways you don't know what any other kind of experience is. But I think that's sort of the beauty of being an immigrant. You get to see both things. You know, you, you have a certain lens and then you bring it to a different place and you see how things play out through that lens. Um, I have to say I was always, my heritage is all about texture, tactility, you know, smells, sounds, it, it can be, you know, it is all about that. Um, the sensual and the sensory um, have always been ingrained in my DNA, but I think, it, I think it is so for everyone else, but I think I can say quite fairly that the understanding of the importance of that um, to one's own um, psyche is very different in those two places. And I think that's why one of those, you know, some of the slides that I showed of, of like the places that I'm from, they're about a lot of color, they're about physical engagement, even like the simple act of, you know, a, a regular blessing that someone puts in front of their house. This is an art of making. And that making and the sense of craft, I think, is also very closely tied to these cultures where you are not so dissociated from how things are made. And also, I think coming from places where it is very difficult to make things, you know, like whether it was a safety pin or a car, it was quite difficult, um, you know, to imagine these things being made. We have managed to leapfrog technologies and, and sort of, you know, get to a world stage in, in a different kind of way. But you do appreciate things that are made by hand, I think, in a very different way than um, things that are made by machines. And it's a very beautiful um, opportunity that I think we have 
um, and I see so much beauty in, in Mariana's work, it's of bringing both of those things together, of really seeing how the hand and the machine can come together in this way that really produces something more than both. And I really think that that's an amazing, amazing, super rich ground to explore. Um, I, I will, I, yes, I, I somehow agree with all of those comments related to the relationship between materials and craft. Um, I, I love Suchi, the way you just described the impossibility to escape our individual experiences. It is what it is. Um, and as I hear you speak, I'm trying to reflect on mine. I think for me, my early interests were uh, in the relationship of architecture and art practices, uh, but art practices related to, um, to the larger world of culture, because I find that art is always um, so much faster and better than architecture at being bold, at breaking boundaries, and testing new territories, at pushing people to perhaps uncomfortable um, realizations related to important topics. And in that sense, uh, that intersection creates opportunities. And um, this notion of the sublime related to art that is very much associated with the experience of the senses, which I think Suchi is describing beautifully. So sometimes is the, the smell or our visual um, experience. For me, the, world, the word atmosphere perhaps captures more broadly uh, what those mean. And I don't know if I would not associate this necessarily with a Latin American experience, uh, but definitely this, um, uh, this relationship between uh, crafts and, and matter as a form of manipulation and production uh, stays with me. Um, that's why I wanted to show the inside of that machine, because on the outside, some of these pieces look very high tech. But, I, you know, on the day we installed that, it was like 100 million degrees and our computer got really, really hot. Literally, one thing you don't see in the photo is a bag of ice that we had to put under the computer to keep it running, to keep the algorithm running. So for me, this dependency on, I mean, I love technology and we use technology all the time, but um, this reliance on technology in a specific way uh, to solve things is less interesting to me. And it's more these intersections between the low tech, the high tech, the tactile, the ready-made, the pre-made, the post-made and the things that don't fit in any of the little sort of boxes or categories. So it resists specialization um, because you cannot resolve it through one channel. Well, I think that, you know, definitely in, in the work of, of both of the presenters, we see how uh, inspiring you are in terms of resolving and overcoming limitations. Uh, and I think that that's uh, what, you know, really begins to create an opportunity for you both to, you know, investigate not only the limitations of the material, but the limitations of technology and how you marry that together. And then from that is born an opportunity to create something amazing. So I think that, you know, within that context, it's, um, it, it's uh, amazing to see the work and to see uh, how you, uh, I, I feel like as an immigrant, that's something that we do very well, like overcoming these kind of uh, impossibilities of things or restrictions and as also as architect as well. I feel that as architects and designers, we see the world through really possibilities. You know, we see the problem, but we also think very quickly about how to address, you know, and how to uh, deal with situations. And, and, and so to see how you guys have um, really brought together, you know, the limitations of technology and the limitations of the material, I feel that it might have some also uh, something to do with how you grew up and the kind of um, limitations in other aspects. It doesn't have to be necessarily in architecture, but this ability to be resilient and to come back to from, from things. Any comments from you? Either one. I think resilience has to be 
part of architecture, right? Um, I was thinking, Mariana, about what you were saying about, you know, both of our fascination, my practice as an uh, installation artist and making these installations. And like I was talking about before we started um, started the lecture, um, I'm currently installing this piece that has to do with humans and AI and really looking at the wisdom of both things and how you put them together. And this idea of resilience, actually, it's also really interesting. We were just um, asked to create a poster as part of a NYC by design thing. And it was about a resilient New York. This is kind of what we're thinking. This idea of resilience, I think, is part of architecture. It's part of culture. It's part of any time that we as humans encounter a limitation. And I think we're, or you know, something that's um, that's a little scary. Um, that we don't know, you know, if it's going to push us back on our feet or if we're going to bounce from that. But there is that little bit of unknown in there that I think actually triggers this resilience. I think I've seen um, this uh, this idea transform not just from people uh, to architecture, but to cities and to countries, right? We've, we've seen this happen. And we know that this is a human characteristic, resilience. And one of the most interesting things I think is to take these kinds of human characteristics like wisdom or resilience or love or justice or tenderness and then see how to spatialize those things, how to make them into experiences. Because this kind of feedback loop is also very interesting to me of how ideas and thoughts and feelings can influence physical matter and how physical matter does the same to the other. You know, so um, anyway, I don't know if I even commented properly on that, but it was a whole series of thoughts between <laughs> you said and what Mariana said. Yes. No, maybe I just would add that um, in this case, I think hopefully we use technology in the best possible way. Uh, and going back to the question of who has access, if technology can be used to give access to certain experiences to people that otherwise would not have access, either because of their physical characteristics, their location in the world, so on and so forth. Um, I, I didn't show this project today because I actually showed it in another talk I gave for the Venice uh, Pavilion um, a little while ago. Um, but in that sense, I think things like VR and AR are opening up uh, conversations about um, access and experience that were just simply not possible before. So I think this connects to resilience as well and how technology builds um, opportunity. Uh, now, the one thing that I would say uh, relative to that is that I think for a very long time, things, words like technology or information or data, they were assumed to be uh, sort of agnostic and um, I always sort of kind of position myself a little bit differently in that actually uh, decisions about um, who writes the code in our uh, software, who uh, collects the data and how that data is gathered and manipulated and then conclusions are drawn. The data in on itself is very biased. Uh, and then in this case, the people behind the exercise of using data for design or collecting data that then informs design needs to be uh, folded into this conversation of inclusion and um, justice and um, other variables, particularly as we work in the world of technology that I think equally to our world has been not an easy place for women until not a long time ago, not an easy place for immigrants and so on and so forth. So the more that other forms of ownership and production of information is available, the more that technology is gonna become uh, part of those conversations of resilience and justice. Yeah, I really think the more I work with technology, the more I get asked the question, you know, how do you think of its power? And it's, you know, and I think Mariana is very right. I think it, it increases inclusion, it increases, um, um, our awareness increases opportunity, but it is very important to recognize that it is also um, can encode human bias. And that if we are self-aware and we can look, use it to look at the data in the world through the lenses of equity and empathy, those are the ways in which we can actually make data work for everybody. And it's not necessarily how it's done in the world, you know, but perhaps through um, the media of art or architecture, we can actually do that. We can actually make a voice for that kind of thing. Um, and I'd be so excited to see, you know, how that happens as we go forward.
you know, we're, we're talking about um, our cultural backgrounds and our, um, you know, thoughts as immigrants. And then we're talking about technology and technology um, sort of being the thread that pulls us all together into one inclusive space, right? That we're all equals and everything uh, is accessible um, if it's done right. Um, and then within our um, sort of increasingly uh, connected global society, um, we find our students, you know, going out into the, to the world and working on projects that are not necessarily based in the U.S., right? They're, they're often based internationally um, in the firms that they practice and work in. And I know both of you um, work, of course, here, but also um, in other countries. Um, do you find that, you know, the way that you deploy your work or the way that it's received or the way that technology is used in your work um, is different um, when you work internationally than, than um, you know, a place like the United States. Um, and, you know, since we're a school uh, here and we have a, an audience of educators and, and students, you know, how might we um, bridge any gaps um, in our education that might facilitate um, and enable our students to work in countries um, that are perhaps their own and go back and make a difference if, if they, they show so wished. Maybe, Switchy, do you want to go? I'm happy to start this one. <laughs> uh, no, I was going to say that um, I find the very interesting tension in the American yeah. sort of context, which is that on one hand, technologically and in terms of resources, we have access to anything and everything. Right. The most advanced um, technologies and things that are not even out there in the world in the context of academia, we can pilot. But if you look at what's happening in architecture and in design, it's quite conservative compared to the rest of the world. So you have those two polar extremes, right? Like the possibility of technology and the resources was economic um, and, and infrastructural, but then, you know, the built environment and even some of the artistic practices, I wouldn't say are the boldest, most envelope pushing uh, practices. So I think what's interesting is one of the things I do love about teaching in the US is that we do have students from everywhere. And those students can come and take these and leverage and put it back out there in the world here or there. The question is how we can perhaps transform more a little bit the local context rather than the outside context mm -hmm. that is ready to absorb new ideas. And it's kind of hungry for that type of disruption. There's something about the status quo in the US in terms of who gets to build and what gets to be built um, that doesn't seem to be that interested in that edge condition. I cannot explain it, it's just an observation. Actually, it's so interesting when you talk about teaching in both places, you know, it's making me think of it. Um, the last time I taught in India, um, I had a class where I had, I think it was 14 students and two of them were men and both of them dropped out. And so it was this really interesting, play. I was like, oh, we're all women in this class. Okay, this is a little, you know, unusual, but, um, but it was actually what I think is so interesting about if you look at it from that lens, you know, especially in a world that gets more and more and more polarized all the time, whether it's here or elsewhere, or it's across national or international boundaries, I think, both architecture and um, uh, particularly the practice of teaching architecture has this really great ability to bring to bridge that and to really mix and meld things into you know the world which is a hybrid I think you know whether everybody accepts it or not we've definitely moved towards a hybridized state whether it's physical and digital or it's national and international and you know I think the sooner we accept that, the sooner we're going to evolve into something that's bigger and better and beyond us. And it's really interesting that, you know, for me, I consider it really a privilege that every time I get to work on a piece that's actually seen by a lot of people, it's an opportunity to talk about these kinds of things, that it is an opportunity to say this exists, this is a boundary we can cross, and that as architects, as people who think outside of boundaries, and without boundaries, by collaborating with all kinds of different people, bringing all of these different disciplines into our conversations, 
we're the ones that are the most perfectly equipped to really think about how to erase boundaries. And I think that's a very important thing to keep in mind, you know, for all of the students that are listening. Um, I really think that that's something to go forth into the world with. Um, to be armed without boundaries would be really amazing. Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, this conversation has um, emerged into something that is fascinating. We were talking about uh, your work in the realm of, you know, the profession. But we have moved toward, towards this idea of, you know, how do we help our students uh, also emerge and, and, and thrive uh, when they uh, sometimes don't see themselves as those professionals um, that actually make it. And so it's a responsibility, I think, uh, from, from our point of view to actually support and, and, and be able to provide the guidance and mentorship. And I think that something that you said, Mariana, earlier was so important to hear this idea of mentorship. Uh, mentorship that you had growing up for you, it wasn't like a big deal. You, you were just doing your thing. They normalized that situation for you. So you saw it as something that it was obtainable. It wasn't something out of your reach. And I think it's really important for us to really think about how do we make uh, that opportunity for everyone. So it's not necessarily, you know, only the ideas of technologies, but also the idea of being able to inspire those. And, uh, you know, from your point of view, how do you guys think about that? Because we, you both teach and you're both exposed to young minds and, and, and the students. Um, how do you become that mentor? You know, I, uh, I actually was fully aware that my situation was not necessarily normal. I even as I was going through it, I could uh, count myself lucky to be able to work with these interesting female um, leaders and mentors. I, I take mentorship very seriously in my role as a teacher and as part of an academic environment, uh, not only to women, but definitely uh, also to women. Um, and I think we should all do it constantly. Nobody succeeds without that support uh, network. Um, and I think that's very important. But another thing that I would say is that I don't know if you would all agree with this, but uh, I think at least my generation, we were very accepting of the status quo and figuring out ways to operate within that. I think your generation are actually not that ready to accept it. And really the push to transform things are not only coming now from people that are in positions of leadership or finding themselves being mentors, but the push is also coming from the people that are now younger generations of students. And I think that's pretty remarkable and great. And I don't know if that happens everywhere. Definitely this is a country where we're lucky to have freedom in many ways. And those conversations can be had safe, safely um, so hopefully that opportunity is not wasted and then something grows that, and I don't think this is the only place where this happens, but certainly an important one. And um, creating that habit uh, and letting that habit, you know, through our relationships to our places of origin also connect to the way this is being done in other places. I think it begins to make more robust uh, a structure through which other voices can succeed, other voices can develop work, and other models through which work can be done. And then I see also hope and optimism there and advancement. Yeah, I have to say, um, my uh, experience with mentorship was not the same as Mariana. So I was really happy to hear that, Mariana, you had that experience. Um, for me, I didn't come across uh, mentors until very late in my career. Um, at which point, uh, you know, there were senior colleagues with whom I could um, talk to, uh, to whom I could talk about things that I had encountered and perhaps, you know, had I handled them the right way or not, or, you know, were, was there wisdom, you know, that I could collect from um, the collective that would actually help me. And it's been so wonderful to actually get to a point where you can feel that. And, and I totally agree that, you know, it's, it's, so important to bring this idea of support 
I think, you know, and this I think is crucial to the discussion of being an immigrant because, you know, if you come to this, the support is the thing that as an immigrant, you work so hard to generate and create for yourself because you've left every support structure you knew and you're coming into these new ones and you have to create new ones. You have to forge new relationships. You have to understand who you are within those relationships and you have to negotiate a whole set of, you know, cultural and um, other difficulties and limitations while you encounter and create those networks. Um, and it's a very, very, I would say, enriching process to actually go through that and to feel brave enough to, to create that for yourself and know that you can make it for yourself, that you didn't rely on anything that you came in with, that you are actually capable of making these things happen. And I think that's something that's, that's really important. You know, and I, I tell a lot of younger people who come from different places who ask me these kinds of questions, like, how did you do this? Or how did you do that? It's like, but A, by thinking that it's possible, you know, and that is, I think, you know, the, the role of mentorship, honestly, is like, that's what you take, right? You're somebody, that you see doing something can show you that you can do that if you want to. And it's really a question of then deciding, is it something you want to do or how do you want to do it? Or could you do it better? Or, you know, all of those other questions that you should raise um, as someone who's involved. But I totally agree with Mariana that younger people these days um, are certainly, I think, dissatisfied with the status quo and that we certainly tried to work within those limitations to a large degree and then break out of some as far as we could. Um, but I would really encourage everybody like, you know, it's the only way we're going to solve climate change is if, you know, these kids all say this is not good enough and we've got to do something about it, the environment, the climate, all of it, you know, and it's not that the people who went before them didn't care. Um, we did care and we did what we could within the systems that we were able to do them within, but there are new ways of thinking about that, I think. And I think it won't happen unless you actually ask for that. So the power to ask for something is also, I think, something to remember, particularly in the context of these kinds of backgrounds that we are discussing. I think this is, all, uh, everything has been so inspiring for our students uh, and, and it really, uh, you know, I'd like to open it up to the audience um, for questions. So if you do have a question, um, please uh, either, you know, raise your hand or post it and we'll, we'll uh, you know, happy to, to chat with you. But, you know, all of this, um, you know, starts to talk about also sort of uh, having a strong voice, right? And valuing yourself um, because, you know, you're, if you value yourself and your contribution to everything, then people will value you too, right? So I think that there's, there's something about um, the way uh, we carry ourselves and the way we kind of, um, uh, you know, find our voice in a room, right? Because we've all been in a room where, as Mariana said, you know, we're the only one with an accent or we're the only woman in the room or we, we feel different in some way. Um, but not to dwell too much on that difference, but to actually, you know, say what 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 is need, needed to be said, um, and make make sure that you know um, that voice is heard. So you know, if if, if either of you can talk a little bit about um, you know uh, the voice of either the immigrant or a woman in this profession and the value that that brings. Um, to the richness and diversity of conversations you may have been part of. Um, we can uh, chat a little bit about that and then perhaps others have questions from the audience. So funny that you are talking about voice. My, my latest culture is all about voice. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, and it is about giving voice, but giving everyone a place to have a voice. And I think that that's super important for people to know, you know, to know that you need to speak up, that you need to be heard, that, you know, um, but also I was thinking the thing that would be nice not to overlook is the fact that, you know, the condition of, of being from somewhere else actually gives you some skills and potential and some opportunity that you don't have if you're from there. You know, it is actually a really great thing to do. This is why people travel and they go places, you know, because it gives you a different perspective. It gives you an opportunity to do something or see something or, you know, um, compare it to a different kind of parameter that somebody else doesn't know. So in some ways, it's like having secret knowledge, 
And you kind of want to play with that sort of superpower and see what you can do with that, you know, in terms of voice, in terms of really accepting, you know, the multiplicity of that. I think that's built into the DNA of immigrants, I think, of being able to hear lots of different kinds of things. I used to get this question all the time is like, why don't you have an accent? You know, and I, I remember I gave a, a lecture once about architecture and vernacular architecture and this idea of why don't you have an accent? You know, how does this how does this play? And I said, well, you know, when you try to speak French, you speak it with a French accent, right? And so when I came here, I came to the deep south. So you could you could just imagine you know, what that experience. I was like, okay, I don't know if I understand this language, but let me try. I think I knew it, you know. So it's it's actually a very interesting journey to find your voice, to find your accent, to find what you say. But I actually think it's an amazing journey to be on. Um, and in some ways, I, I really relish it and I love seeing that journey in other people. I love seeing it, it's always inspiring. Um, you know. And uh, yeah, I would want everyone, you know, anyone who's listening or is inclined to think that um, their voice should not be heard or isn't heard or, you know, isn't good enough to be heard really feels like anybody's voices needs to be heard. Everyone's voice needs to be heard. So they really need to just put it out there in whatever form it is um, so that we can see how it fits in with the whole. Thank you so much. Uh, and I, I don't know, Mariana, if you want to add something to that. I think Suchi said it beautifully. I, I think so too. Uh, I think, you know, we, Farsana and I had have had an amazing time uh, organizing this event. Uh, and we were so happy that uh, the two of you agreed to join us. So I would like to thank you and, to, you know, from the bottom of our heart, and uh, your presentation has been so inspiring to us. Uh, we really appreciate it. We hope that you know we we can have you again in some form or another. Um, also to our dean for supporting this event and for the lecture committee for supporting this event for our faculty, our students that attended today and made it all so great. So with that, I would like to uh, Farsana, if you would like to say a couple of words, and also to Alessandro Melis to close our event. Yeah, no, I, I just echo uh, Trudy's comments. This has been an incredibly rich uh, conversation, but also a rich body of work that you both have shared that's been inspiring to our community. So thank you for that. Um, and I, I look forward to other ways that we can all intersect uh, in the future. Uh, Alessandro, if we wanna uh, make any closing remarks. Uh... Thank you. Thank you very much, Parzana. I'm... I, I, I have to repeat what you already said. Uh, I think Suchi and Mariana, this was really impressive. Wow, I mean, I have filled here five pages of notes and consideration. I would like to have more information. So I hope that we will have the chance uh, to discuss with you even more about this. Uh, I will, I, I, because of this, I, I need to thank you, uh, not, not only uh, Farzana and Trudy for the amazing coordination and organization of the work, but also uh, Pablo Erof, that uh, Pablo was the uh, chair was of this uh, the committee of lecture and event before me, and of course this is part of uh, the process that he was coordinating, and so I have to thank him for this. And I want to uh, to say a big thank you to Susan Sternberg. Uh, she was really amazing this last few days to uh, keep uh, let's say to bridging all the things from. Uh, uh, the thing within the committees. And uh, I think that uh, this was really a great event. I think that we have discussed, and I think that now we are, we are all more aware that the status quo is not an option. And uh, I thank you also, Sushi, for the, uh, reminding us how important is as for something, how important is activism in this specific uh, period, and that we have to accept both of you that in a way at least this is part of the notes that i have here that we have to accept complexity complexity and not think in a binary way and that creativity can help to do this and i, I would like to add that uh, yes in a way the female voice is uh, it's a title but it's it's just uh, uh, it's what we have shown us it goes much more beyond we are talking about inter we have been talking listening to you about discussion about intersectionality 
and that we have, I love this sushi, that we have to accept the new state of hybridity. And I think this goes beyond the issue of virtuality and technology. I think it's a, it's a metaphor of everything you want, we are saying. And thank you, Sushi, for also the emotional part of the, of the, uh, of the lecture. I think that many of us are, have similar feelings about uh, immigration. And uh, I want to remind, I mean, at least this is one of my favorite pieces that uh, this is a nation of immigrants, just to quote the, uh, the book written by John Kennedy in 1958. Uh, this is the place where immigration become not uh, an alternative to citizenship. They, they, they should live together. I think this is the, the spirit of the society, society, American society that you would like to keep with us. And I think that uh, this is, a, let's say, this is an hope, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's also an opportunity. Uh, so thank you very much for, for this. I hope to have again the opportunity and uh, to, to, to listen to your lecture in the future, to your presentation, to see more about your project. And uh, still thinking about, uh, as Einstein said, we cannot solve the problems with the instruments which created, which created them. So we have to open ourselves to the unknown, the complexity, uh, because this is the place where senses can allow us to uh, find new opportunities right in the place where uh, we didn't look at before. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.